Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. A week today, a big demonstration in London will take place. Stand up against racism and fascism. No to scapegoating immigrants. No to Islamophobia. No to anti-Semitism. Co-organizers of the event are Unite Against Fascism, a broadly based campaign which in dark days and fine have kept the flame of such ideals alive. The march will take place through a backdrop of mass unemployment amongst ethnic minority youth in Britain, a deluge of scaremongering in the gutter media, and a Dutch auction amongst political parties as to who can be meanest and most menacing towards minority communities. As election fever mounts, so do the fears of Britain's beleaguered minorities. Joining us now is a stalwart of anti-fascism in Britain, Sabi Dalu. Sabi, thanks for coming on the Sputnik. Um, we'll talk about the demonstration in a few minutes, but the airwaves are becoming clogged up with race stories, uh, more usually than not anti-Muslim stories, but in this week, Nigel Farage's extraordinary foray into demanding the repeal of race discrimination laws in the British workplace. This is part of the backdrop to your demonstration, isn't it? Of course. I mean, Farage's um, recent outburst is um, not borne out by the facts at all. I mean, one of the problems we've had is um, since the uh, coalition government came to power in 2010 is the abolition of um, um, monitoring um, the impact um, of legislation on minority communities and women. So equality impact assessments have been abolished. So it's impossible to actually ascertain proper figures of how austerity and other government measures have impacted on women, minority communities, uh, people with disabilities, um, and so on. And so therefore... Proper figures might be thin on the ground, but... Uh, any, any, any fool knoweth Absolutely. that the claim that Farage has made that racism in the workplace is a thing of the past, that Britain has moved on. Uh, you're a minority ethnic uh, and a woman. That's right. Uh, what do you say to that? <laughs> well, my experience is the exact opposite. I've actually found if, over the last five years, certainly, um, in the context of austerity, um, a rise in racism. I see um, people making funny comments, racist comments on buses, on public transport and things like that. Things I thought were a thing of the past and I've actually not experienced since I was a child growing up in the late 1980s. Um, so certainly um, they're, they're racism has been on the increase um, but also there were figures released um, I think by the Labour Party yesterday um, saying that unemployment amongst uh, BME communities actually increased by 50%. 50, yeah. So the idea that racism in the workplace um, is a thing of the past. Uh, for that reason, uh, BME communities in the police force. So, so I think that it is just not every... OK, there aren't equality impact assessment, but every other statistic, in fact, shows that um, uh, racism is alive and kicking on the rise. He's not, of course, a fascist, Nigel Farage, neither are UKIP, but there are fascists in Britain uh, menacing minority communities. Let's run across the horizon on that. My assessment is that uh, street racism in the form of, for example, the EDL uh, has begun to dissipate. The recent failure of the German import Pegida mm. at their demonstration in Newcastle was just that, a real damp squib outnumbered 10, 15 to 1 by overwhelmingly uh, non-Muslim, non-minority ethnic white people from Newcastle. Uh, is that your assessment? Are these people more a danger as lone wolves than any kind of mass movement? I think, yes, it is correct that uh, the English Defence League and other similar movements like uh, 
Pegida, as you mentioned, the attempt to set up a British version of uh, Pegida, um, is certainly um, dissipating um, in Britain. And I think, but I think that is because um, organisations like ourselves, Unite Against Fascism, have actually spoke out against the English Defence League and argued consistently, despite opposition, saying that we must mobilise against them. When they mobilise on the streets, it's important for anti-fascists for anti-racists to mobilise against them. And I think we were right, and I think that did actually defeat them. That demoralised them, we out-mobilised them, um, and we won that argument because some people thought that it was causing trouble and it was best to stay at home when they come to town. Um, but I think had we done that, um, I think the EDL would have snowballed into a much bigger street movement. Um, it, because it's, there's a clear relationship between out-mobilising them, particularly in Tower Hamlets in 2011, when there's a really big demonstration opposing the EDL there, out-mobilising them and getting broad support for um, our demonstrations. It really did have a knock-on effect on their morale and their ability to mobilise. Um, well, I, I have no doubt uh, that of the correctness of your line and the heroism of your work. But it's also the case, isn't it? that there has never been, even in the 30s, a mass appetite for fascism. It speaks to the good sense of the great majority of the British public, don't you think? I, I agree, yes. I, I don't think it really stands in the British tradition, but I think it's important for people to speak out against them and mobilise against them, because I think the danger is that one becomes complacent and thinks that, you know, it, this isn't in the British tradition, so we don't really need to worry about it. I think had we not spoken out and stood up against them, I think that um, they could have become a bigger force, um, because we've seen across Europe um, there's a different story. Uh, we've seen Pegida, albeit, you know, they've been out mobilised um, by the anti-racists and anti-fascists in Germany, but to get that size demonstrations, you know, 10,000, 20,000, that sort of level on the streets is a worrying development. Absolutely. We nonetheless have an ongoing problem, partly below the radar. We've got police guarding synagogues, quite mm. rightly, mm. because the danger of anti-Semitic attacks there are clear and present. We don't have police outside mosques. Admittedly, the Muslim population is more than 10 times larger than the Jewish population. But nonetheless, there are ongoing attacks against Muslim property and against individual Muslims, usually by one or two uh, lone wolves. How big a danger is all that? I think it's a very big danger, particularly after the Islamophobic response we've seen post the Paris attacks and the Copenhagen attacks. Um, we have seen um, hashtag kill all Muslims trend on Twitter. We've seen Rupert Murdoch making interventions such as all Muslims are all responsible for this and should be held responsible um, for these attacks. Um, and uh, we saw a complete media silence, um, the complete opposite response to the Chapel Hill shootings in North Carolina, where three Muslim students were shot dead. It, was, it wasn't even covered in the mass media, despite the fact that it trended on social media. And we don't see an attack by people um, to um, hold all white people across the globe responsible for the actions of the, um, the, the gunman or the terrorist that killed the three Muslim students. The thought of it is ludicrous, holding all white mm. people Quite responsible so. for, um, for, for that shooting. But this is what happens to the Muslim community. Um, over a billion people across the globe are made to feel responsible for the actions of a handful of terrorists. This is despite condemnation widespread across the globe um, by Muslim people. Um, against these attacks and we have seen as you quite rightly point out attacks on mosques and attacks on individual Muslims and perhaps more worryingly so attacks on Muslim women wearing the hijab uh, we see a lot of uh, I think around 50% of or more than 50% of attacks on Muslims are actually on Muslim women and I think that's quite horrific um, for Muslim women to be facing violent attacks violent racist attacks but also sexist because the perpetrators are mostly men um, so this is very worrying and you're right that the the state response isn't the same uh, 
as uh, attacks on Jewish communities and anti-Semitism. I mean, quite rightly, there are police guarding synagogues. Indeed, there should that's be the right. same. Yes, yes that's right. Should be the why, same. why aren't um, mosques and Muslim community organisations treated in the same fashion? Mm. This is what we need. And I think you're right. I think that the English Defence League and attempts by uh, groups like Pegida here in Britain to try and um, form themselves here um, will use... Um, not just the um, attacks in Paris and Copenhagen, but the Islamophobic response by the state and the media and politicians to try and grow. So it is very important that we don't become complacent and wherever they rear their ugly head, that we mobilize against them. Tell us about the demonstration uh, a week uh, today. Well, precisely because of um, the rise in Islamophobia, the rise in anti-Muslim hate crime, um, opposing Islamophobia and standing up against this hatred um, is a central part of the demonstration and we've um, received a very positive response um, by Muslim communities across the country who uh, are saying they're mobilising and coming along to the demonstration. So that's very good. It's formally supported by the Muslim Council of Britain along with a range of other Muslim organisations. So that will all be a key part of the demonstration, as will opposing anti-Semitism. I think it's very important to show unity. Yeah. Yeah. unity um, it's the other side of the coin, as you say, Gayatri. It's a, it's a real and present danger. Well, absolutely. I mean, the, the experience of Muslim communities at the moment is almost identical to the experience of Jewish communities in the early 20th century and in the uh, 1930s. The cartoons that um, we see depicting the Prophet Muhammad um, are, are almost identical to the cartoons that one saw attacking the Jewish communities um, over 100 years ago. So I think it's very important um, that we show unity against this form of hatred mm. and unite the Muslim and Jewish communities who, um, who have both historically been attacked um, by fascists and, and racists. That's right. Uh, yeah, that's another thing. Where is it uh, from and to times, etc.? Um, we're assembling at 12 noon on Saturday, the 21st of March, outside BBC Portland Place, um, and we'll be marching to Trafalgar Square. And I'm one of the speakers. You absolutely are. We will be very you, <laughs> looking forward to seeing you. You have a galère uh, of orators. Well, I, I wish you the very best for the demonstration next Saturday. Uh, but also take my metaphorical hat off to all the work that Unite Against Fascism has been doing. You really are heroes. Sabi Dalo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Coming up after the break, the father of all Batman, Matt O'Connor of Fathers for Justice. Don't miss it. <laughs> Welcome back to Sputnik. Matt and Nadine O'Connor are the public faces of one of the biggest civil rights campaigns in Britain, Fathers for Justice. Not that you'd know it if you followed only the so-called mainstream media, still less if you were stuck inside the Westminster bubble. Politicians run scared of the idea that a child is entitled to both parents in their lives. Prisoners of the mother is always right mentality. But mothers are not always right. Sometimes they're wrong, and even willfully so, playing out their anger, justified or otherwise, towards the father, irrespective of the impact on the children's well-being. Feckless fathers abound in Britain, men who walk out on their children again and again. But millions of fathers are desperate to be closely involved in their children's lives and are precluded by the family court system from doing so. It is a Gordian knot. Trying to unravel it is Matt O'Connor, and he joins us now. Matt, thanks for coming on board you, the George. Sputnik. Before we move on more specifically to your field, it's not tangential, I would argue, the extraordinary decision of the Supreme Court this week to allow a woman, more than 20 years after their divorce, to file a claim for a financial settlement against the man they finally divorced uh, more than two decades ago? Or do you think it is tangential? Well, it is. It's uh, absolutely wrapped up in the whole um, approach that the uh, legal system takes to men and to fathers, which is effectively, uh, George, is to, is to reduce us to the status of cash points. It's like going out on a Saturday night and, and putting your card into a machine and the cash just keeps coming. I mean, it, it's a dream scenario. Um, but it, it reflects badly, I think, this judgment on the British justice system. 
here, it's, it's an outrageous judgment, even by their own pitifully low standards. It basically says that this guy is a cash point, not just when he was married, but a cash point for life. And this is a woman who is a grown woman, clearly can look after herself, clearly can be responsible for herself, clearly can provide for herself. She has no dependencies. So this is a very serious and worrying judgment. I think a lot of men will be running scared now and very, very concerned that this basically opens up some serious doors and to potential future claims. It's a slight infantilization of women, isn't it? Uh, the idea that yeah. in uh, the 21st century, uh, for decades after uh, the marriage has ended, that somehow they're dependent upon a man and... women to the status of victims uh, and to states of being dependents and I think the the idea behind feminism that women would be yeah. empowered mm -hmm. to stand on their yeah, own two feet it, yeah. uh, to be responsible for their actions and, and, and I think this idea somehow um, that that isn't the case is fundamentally wrong and I think we need to uh, really step back from uh, the issues and 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 look at the whole issue and say why is it that fathers are still seen in law as being cash points. Well, uh, let's turn to that uh, subject. I, I have become grimly familiar uh, with this system, and I represent many people. Uh, one just last Saturday, for example, came in to see me, showed me all the paperwork, that the child maintenance service has been taking a very substantial amount of money from him every month, uh, against which there's no meaningful appeal. The, Figures are laid down, there's no flexibility, and so on. But the key point is that he has not seen the child in question for seven years, despite courts regularly saying he ought to have access to the child. The mother has simply refused, and there seems to be no meaningful mechanism by which his rights, I'll come back to that point, his rights or the child's right to see him uh, can be respected. Yeah, uh, and this is not an unusual case. This is this is common stuff. Um, yeah, I've got a friend of mine whose um, daughter was taken out of the jurisdiction to Scotland. Um, he's a he's a train driver. Um, he's paid I think somewhere in the region of forty five fifty thousand pounds over the last ten years. The girl's now fourteen, uh, and and it's an outrage. I've got another friend of mine who who has spent over fifty thousand pounds trying to see his daughter. Um, to get court orders that are enforced. The CSA comes along, cleaned out his bank account, taking his money, friend to take his passport, took his driving licence. They have quasi-judicial powers, the CSA or the Child Maintenance Service, as they now call it. Uh, and, and these are really serious issues that if the coin was flipped and reversed, and this was happening to mothers, there would be a national outcry about it. And that's our point about this, is the the gender apartheid that applies to people like me because basically we're white, we're male, that somehow um, we are at the top of the tree. Whereas in reality, as uh, the author Warren Farrell said, there is a glass cellar uh, where, where men are kept. Uh, <laughs> because if you look at it, you look at it, we have um, we, uh, suicide is the biggest killer of men under the age of 45. We're more likely to be homeless, uh, more likely to be unemployed, more likely to be subject to violence more likely to be incarcerated and more likely to be murdered. Uh, on, on many, many, many levels, men and the issues related to men and men's health uh, just really aren't paid any due serious attention by our political classes. And it is uh, indeed uh, ironic. Let me, though, go back to a dichotomy I glanced at in my last question. It is the fundamental principle of the Children's Act that it's the children that has rights, not the parents. Uh, the problem with that is that arrogates or derogates to someone else, namely a judge, in a secret court, because yeah, this is not open absolutely. to the public. One may not discuss in public any of these cases. Mm. Uh, it derogates to a judge the right to decide what the children's interest is. Now, I actually question that in principle. I'm a father, by the grace of God, many times over. I have rights, in my view, to see my children. Yeah. Whether a judge thinks 
children uh, have an interest or a, 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 a case for seeing me. What do you, what's your take on that? My take on it is very, very simple. There's a small thing called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that enshrines everybody's rights to family life. That's our starting point. That's what everybody signed up to. Yes, of course a child has rights, but to say that fathers have no rights uh, is an outrage. Uh, and as you rightly say, we have an unelected, unaccountable, unsackable judiciary operating in complete secrecy that determines what the best interest of a child is. Now, the thing is about this best interest of a child argument is a wicked, wicked deceit that lies at the heart of a rotten and corrupt family justice system. And I'll tell you why. Because nobody has kept any records on the outcomes for children who've been for the family justice system. This is not based on evidence. This is based on what the judge thinks the child's best interest is. And as we've seen, with four million fatherless children in this country now, with all the social consequences that flow from that, um, the family courts are fundamentally abusive uh, and out of control. And we, it's just like legalised cage fighting. And um, we need to have a proper... Um, review and inquiry into their operation. Matt, since we last interviewed you, they cut down the legal aid in family court. Mm. It must have had a tremendous effect on fathers and the children. Yeah, it's had perhaps uh, less of an effect on fathers because many fathers didn't qualify um, for legal aid. But what it has done uh, is reduced the family courts to legalised cage fighting, where most of the people going into the system are not legally represented. Uh, and, and, and so you're literally pitching parent against parent, to prove who the best parent is, you have to prove who the worst is. Um, and I always say, courts are for criminals, not families. This is not a place for any family um, to be uh, judged, let alone by a 70 or 80 year old judge who's got a public school boy uh, from Eton clicking his false teeth, as I've seen them do regularly in courts, uh, operating in secrecy and I think, um, I think we need a complete review of the family justice system so we have a proper accountable fair and balanced system of family justice supported by a presumption what I believe what I campaign for a presumption of 50 50 shared mm. parenting so we have a quality proper quality for the system somebody says to me well why would you start with 50 50 equality is like pregnancy you can't be a little bit pregnant you either have it or you don't yeah, you should start from that presumption. There are many cases in which that 50-50 would be altered. Of course. Uh, but the presumption should yeah. be 50-50. By the way, the cuts in legal aid uh, issue is worse, if I may say so, than you stated, because the one criterion that you still can get legal aid is if you allege that there has been domestic violence. And yeah, yeah. mothers who claim there was domestic violence get legal aid. So you have a situation where my constituents, sometimes inarticulate, sometimes uh, undereducated, certainly underqualified, are up against qualified and polished barristers who are being paid for by the state, but the father is there left to his own uh, devices. How unfair is that? Yeah, uh, but that was always the case to some extent. It was always a case where you, a mother, would qualify for legal aid. Um, if you tick the box that says there's been abuse. Now, the thing is, um, with the domestic violence lobby, um, abuse these days can constitute financial abuse, which is dispute over credit cards, emotional abuse, arguing in the car about where you're going on the map, you know, arguing, discussions like that. Uh, so it's not just related to violence, but also every father is now risk assessed. So CAFCAS, mm. the court welfare service, collect soft evidence, which is... Yeah, arguments in the household between mother and father and hard evidence, which is if there's been police reports or complaints to the police. But every father is risk assessed because they say where it is safe to do so. Contact can take place where it's safe to do so. So the presumption, George, is that you and me are inherently dangerous to our children. And that assumption doesn't apply to mother. It doesn't apply to mother's new boyfriend. It yeah. is grotesquely unfair and prejudicial based solely on our gender. Don't get me started on Kafkas. <laughs> Matt O'Connor, Fathers for Justice. I salute you.
Pleasure. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? Well, in response to Nigel Farage's outrageous comments on racial discrimination in the working uh, place, uh, Marcia Brown responses, just another hairball policy belched out to satisfy the knuckle draggers. When I uh, put out the article about the woman um, getting the... The uh, right to sue on the divorce. Yes, by the Supreme Court. Lots of responses. Most of them agree that it's not really fair, both men and women, by the way. Craig Hill says, after 20 years since he remarried, it's going to be an open season for any woman to take ex-husbands to courts wanting payouts. And that's all that we've got time for this week. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show and almost the end of the Sputnik. Join us next week for the very last orbit. Why? Stay in touch with us on Twitter, RT underscore Sputnik, or Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous. <laughs> <laughs>